Top 22 Questions Muslims Refuse to Answer Question number 1. If God is all-powerful, and has unlimited powers to do anything he wants, and is the creator of all, then why can't he have a son and become man? Question number 2. When were our scriptures corrupted and why? Did Christians all want to go to hell after glorifying a mere man? If the Gospels didn't say Jesus Christ died on the cross, and then appeared alive three days later, why were the Gospel writers executed? Why weren't they afraid to die? Why didn't they admit their great lie? Not only the Gospel writers but all of the disciples died painfully. Question number 3. If the disciples didn't all claim that Jesus Christ was the Son of God, and one with God, but preached something different to what we have in our New Testament today, why were they executed? Why were they either stoned, crucified upside down, beheaded, skinned alive and dragged through the rough streets, boiled in hot oil? Why weren't they afraid to go through that? Question number 4. Why did God watch Muhammad die slowly and painfully, before his message was put into a book? Question number 5. Why didn't God send a replacement, to that dinner when Muhammad had eaten poison? Or why didn't he cause someone else to take the first bite, and warn Muhammad not to eat? Question number 6. If the poison lamb spoke to Muhammad, why did it speak too late? Question number 7. Why does the Quran order the killing of unbelievers, when a person has their whole life to accept God? Why doesn't the Quran concentrate on the conversion of these people? Killing unbelievers while they are unbelievers adds another soldier to Satan's army in hell, and takes another potential believer from God. Question number 8. Why would God allow Muhammad to have 20 wives, then command that believing men, have no more than 4? Question number 9. Since the Bible contradicts the Quran, how can both books be from God? And how can we be worshipping the same God, when your book says that when you kill an infidel, Christian or Jew, you get a one-way ticket to paradise if we worship the same God. Question number 10. Why would Jesus Christ come back and condemn his followers to hell, when we love him so much? Question number 11. How can God be merciful and compassionate, and command the most merciless punishment on those who haven't found him yet? Question number 12. Why do you think Satan wouldn't try to hide behind the mask of God, to make his plan succeed? Question number 13. How can our Creator delight in so much destruction of his creation? Question number 14. How did the storytelling Christians, 
succeed in changing every single Bible that was in existence in the world at the same time. Question number 15. Why does Muhammad say in the Quran, the most awful name in Allah's sight, on the day of resurrection, is a man calling himself the King of Kings? Who is this man? And why is Allah scared of him? What will this man do to Allah on that day? Question number 16. If Allah revealed the Torah and the Bible before the Quran as a guidance, and the Quran says Allah's words could never be changed. Did Allah or Muhammad lie? Since Muslims declare the Bible is corrupted? Question number 17. If the Gospel has been corrupted, wouldn't Allah just tell us to get rid of it and believe in the Quran? If the Gospel has been corrupted, why doesn't Allah know anything about it? Question number 18. Why does the Quran clearly maintain that the Gospel is authoritative for Christians, if it is not the Word of God? Question number 19. When Muhammad was having doubts about his revelations, why did Allah command Muhammad to go to the people of the book, Jews and Christians for confirmation if the Bible was corrupted? Question number 20. The Quran says Jesus was born of a virgin, which would mean that he had no earthly father. Since he had no earthly father, where did his blood come from? Question number 21. Were the demons and all the people that Jesus healed lying when they called him the Son of God? Was Peter and the angel Gabriel also lying when they called Jesus the Son of God? Was God lying when he said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased? Were they all lying when they called Jesus the Son of God? Question number 22. The Quran says Muhammad is not the Word and Spirit of God. The Quran says Jesus Christ is the Word and Spirit of God. If God created the universe through the Word, and the Word is Creator or Creation. Either way you look at it, wouldn't that make Jesus God, since He is the Word of God? Imagine a great king, dressed in royal robes. If this king were walking along the beach and he saw his child drowning in the water, wouldn't he immediately dive in to save his child? Would his royal robes matter to him? No, all that would matter to him at that moment would be the child he loves. If that's how great human love is, how much greater do you think God's love is? In the New Testament, Christians are commanded to be humble. But the example we're given of true humility is of a great king laying aside his glory, diving into the world to save his children. In Philippians we read, In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. This passage, like the rest of the New Testament and even the Old Testament, describes Jesus as God, and yet draws a distinction between Jesus and the Father, which is why the Bible can only be understood in light of the doctrine of the Trinity, the doctrine that God is one in essence and yet exists eternally as three divine persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In John 6.38, Jesus, the Divine Son, 
tells his followers that he came down from heaven. But why would he come down here? Where was the sun going when he left heaven and came to earth as Jesus of Nazareth? Was he going to Bethlehem? Was he going to the cross? Was he going to the tomb? Was he going full circle, leaving heaven only to return there later? Though Jesus went to all of these places, he had a particular destination in mind. He tells us exactly where he was going in the last two verses of John 17, where he says to the Father, Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them, and will continue to make you known, in order that the love you have for me may be in them, and that I myself may be in them, and that I myself may be in them. In who? In us. We were Jesus' destination when he left heaven. In 1 Corinthians 6.19, the Apostle Paul says, Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you? Jesus died on the cross to cleanse new temples for God's glory. And because Jesus has a divine nature, he's the only man in history who could take the full wrath of God and then get up and walk away at his resurrection. We were created to be the walking, talking, living, breathing temples of our Creator. But we sinned and fell short of the glory of God. No matter how wonderful we think we are, nothing we could ever do would make us good enough to stand before God. If we're going to dwell in the presence of God and have God's presence within us, we need a righteousness that comes from God, not from ourselves. Because all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. The word gospel means good news. The good news is that God did something for us that we could never do for ourselves. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. We can now be the holy temples we were created to be because we have the righteousness of Christ. Since there is nothing we can do to earn this righteousness, we receive it by believing what God has told us. For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. So confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead and you will be saved. We were all drowning in our sins, my friends. In fact, we had already drowned. The King of all kings dove in to save us. And that's the Gospel.